What's it take to make the dime drop? Not enough people ask what the history of books and printing is, and it's such an integral part of our daily lives. I'm using the same type that's been around for 75 to 100 years, just not the way it was originally intended. We're in the middle of a real shift in the way people use printing. There are whole areas of printing which have simply disappeared. But one begins to wonder whether we're going to have newspapers anymore. The truth of the matter is it becomes obsolete, which makes it valuable. Welcome to the Hamilton Wood Type Museum. I generally start off our tour just by telling people that wood type is the first product that Hamilton produced. They were all about speed and efficiency in production because the people that cut these letters, they would get paid for each letter that they made. Like oh, really? Day. How many could they make in a day? Something like this, he could cut like three a minute. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, for 10 years they produced wood type and no other product. These are some of the earliest examples of wood type that has been cut by Hamilton. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. See that big, big, huge two in the eye on the wall? Oh, yeah. yeah. Great. Yeah. yeah. They didn't have a limit on how large you could order letters. Oh, could, really? Like, oh, right? Yeah, if you could afford it. Have you guys, have, have you guys created anything this big lately? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. I'm a graphic designer working out of Chicago for a design firm and then doing my own stuff on the side. We're stuck in kind of the computerized uh, techno world, so we only see points and, right. and Bezier tools, and we don't get to see how it used to be done. Yeah, that was my so, life, too. That's yeah. a, I was like, worked as a graphic designer 15 years ago. You know, oh, really? That? Yeah, That's yeah. A, you know. That's great. Yeah. I worked for a number of design firms. But I was spending just about every waking hour cranking out ads. So there's a profession of type finishers, and really, you got burnt out on it. Put in the sharp points, and I thought, well, I'll go see what this museum is about. And, yeah, it's really neat to see. Yeah, a exactly. A P and a Q. That's what they say. Oh. Mind your P's and Q's. <laughs> it comes from that. Hamilton commercially produced wood type all the way until 1985. Gotcha. It co coincides with the introduction of the Macintosh computer. <laughs> <laughs> no, no real coincidence. Yeah. We just literally ran here from the parking lot because we were really excited about coming out and seeing it. It was almost like breathtaking to come in here and just see everything all up on the walls. There's drawers underneath it full of stuff and how you could get so close to it. It's not like pushed back in glass cases. You could actually like feel the history of each letter.
And it's wood. How can you not like wood, right? Metal, I can kind of take it or leave it. But wood. When you come here, you've got to slow down 50%. We people of the computer world want things done very quickly. So that the whole thing here is to de-stress. You're into this letter E, aren't you? I mean, isn't it a wonderful letter? Because it doesn't it's, become yes. a letter anymore. It, yes, it's it's like a, it form. becomes a design yeah. element. Yeah. I'm going to use that ampersand on top of that, too. Oh, 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 yes. Yeah. That would be perfect. I think you should give up your job. Just come here and print. Yeah, we'll, we'll all be poor artists in the old folks' home yeah. if we had to rely on this for a living. When you're with your computer, you'll think back about the smell and the sound and the feel of, of wood and paper and the press and great characters, both wooden and human. I think Two Rivers sometimes makes you a better person because of the people here. For seven days, I'm in limbo. Time stands still like a cocoon. I mean, the ice cream sundae was invented in this town. We opened the Hamilton Museum in the end of May 1999. We negotiated a lease from the Hamilton Company for about 30,000 square feet here. But the lease basically read a dollar a year, which we forgot to pay, but anyway, we moved in, <laughs> and we've been here since. And as far as printers are concerned, when they come here and print a W with wood type, and it's a fancy W or whatever, they go crazy. I mean, this is beautiful. Look at it, there's a wrinkle here, and a little flaw over here. I bought that, it's really nice, you know? When I got the invitation from Jim Van Lannan to come up, he said to Jim, it's not going to be under plexiglass. He said, wood is a living thing. It's got to be used or else it'll just dry up and break. So I said to Jim, you know, where is Two Rivers, Wisconsin? Sign me up. There's about a million pieces of type. I've probably done maybe 200 letters. And I've come here for seven years. There's nothing like it in the world. Little ampersand. Exclamation point. Aren't they beautiful? We're a historical society, so everything seems to be like historically significant. Nobody wants to throw away anything. It looks like trash, but it's not. Essentially, what I have to do is catalog all of that wood type. Seems like, depending on how detailed you are about it, it could be a very long job. This museum has such a rich collection of things that are really the fabric of America. The production of wood type is married to the Industrial Revolution. When people move from farms into cities, 
these postings, they compete with each other. The idea of being louder than the poster next to you becomes a desirable thing because there's a larger population looking at them. There's then it becomes a need for large type. And they couldn't cast large letters in metal. Wood type is what the answer is. It becomes fashion to use these unusual shapes. And most people in 1820 had a classical notion of what aesthetics should be. These things were just horrifying. But it's a popular style, and it clearly succeeds with the public on posters and on advertising in general. The, the fashion follows the success of the market. James Edward Hamilton, he began producing wood type in 1880. Well, he was a smart guy, and he grew in the 1880s very fast. Within a year and a half, they had 24 people on a payroll. These are some of the great New York houses. These were the competitors to Hamilton. For my money, these are the most ambitious and the most beautiful specimens um, printed in America. They were the people who were put out of business sooner or later by Hamilton. In the 1870s and 80s, it was a really, really competitive time. He advertised this type as being 50% less costly than his competitors. Well, he sold so much type in the 1880s that his big competitors got sicker and sicker financially until he bought up five of the largest competitors. And after he bought them up, you know what he did? He doubled the price. <laughs> it's a cutthroat business because it's big business and it's communications business. Gutenberg first made movable type in 1450. And really, if you could set metal movable type, you had a job for another 500 years. I used to think as I was growing up that I'm learning obsolete uh, business. I worked with my dad for 30 years. So when I was 10 years old, you'd go into the shop and you would have to sort out the help box. All that little bit of type that had fallen out of all of the forms over the years, you had to identify those things and put them back in the drawers. And before you were ready to <coughs> set type, you had to be able to throw in type. You know, it's like paying your dues. But you'd get to know type just by punctuation. That's why my eyes are bad. <laughs> Print shops used to almost be like a grocery store. There was one every half mile. You'd always see these print shops close down. They were basically throwing away all of their type. Just drawer upon drawer of type that simply went into a dumpster. Yeah. They weren't going to use that technology anymore, and they thought there's no use for it. They just burned a wood type, threw it in the river. And with the computers entering graphic design, so many people wanted to so quickly throw away all that was learned before. When Hamilton formed the museum, we were both very excited. A lot of designers were actually very excited. And also because college students now, they see this stuff, they're like, wow, so that's how it was done. And there's a real nice renaissance of letterpress printing going on now. Art Nouveau and Art Deco was in large part a response to the Industrial Revolution where there was this saturation of the ability to mass produce things. 
And the craftsmanship, whether it's a Stickley Furniture or William Morris Pattern Book, all of these things took us back to this handmade craft again. And you see it happening again now. This crazy growth in letterpress printing, it directly parallels that, that it's the pendulum swinging back. half pikas from the B to the other piece of furniture. So let's put 15 by, let's try six on either side. And we need some 15 pika long leads in both two point and six point for this guy. Two point, six point, 15, 15. pika long leads and four pika long leads. Is that are six, like six points? I don't okay. grab a bunch of those. Okay. Okay. Society is really flat. We look at computer screens. We look at advertising all over the place. We're bombarded by it. I understand why letterpress is something that people are gravitating towards. The appeal to touch something that when the light reflects onto it, it's just a really tactile, sort of sexy piece of paper. You get something that's luscious, you get a different texture. See what it looks like. Hey! Yeah. So that's that's that is, nice. That is classy. My goodness, girl. Too much? <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna tin that. I think so. Alright. Engage your rollers. Maybe I should wash my hands. And turn it on. And wash your hands. <laughs> It's crazy to think that somebody could get so excited over little pieces of wood, but it's a rush and there's nothing else like it. It's cool, all the like mixing. You can have one. Like, oh, are you kidding me? Yeah, you I'll trade you one. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Yeah. Nice. I always let my students know about Hamilton. They have such an incredible resource that hardly anybody is getting to use right now. It's kind of heartbreaking. It's sad that it's in sort of the middle of nowhere in Wisconsin. Part of Hamilton's charm is the space it's in. It's not in a museum with carpeted floors. It's a factory. This is the pattern here. This is the router bit that cuts it out. All you do is trace the pattern. So 
So off of a three inch pattern, you can cut the one inch, you know, like this. Yeah. Once you have a setup here, you can zoom right around it, you know. But it's a little harder. My eyesight ain't as good anymore, but you know, I gotta start squinting away. <laughs> I suppose nowadays they'd have some uh, some uh, automatic machines doing that, you know. I really don't look uh, back and have any regrets that I, you know, been at the type shop. I mean, they treated me all right there, you know, and all that. They don't get rich over there, but the, it was a fascinating uh, craft. So you have to file the edges all down. Then you take your knife and then you say they have to have a point in here. And you go like that. I was here 19 years, but I, I started out down in the press room. And then they had an opening up here in the type shop. And Ed Chakral, he was like gang leader. He said, a woman will never learn how to trim type. Well, <laughs> when he retired and he was ready to die, he come by me and he says, you are very good. They had a whole thing like this full of all the letters. And uh, then we had just took them as we wanted to. There was about five or six panographers, and then, uh, then the rest of us were trimmers. It wasn't a dirty job, that's why I liked it. At noontime, we played cards there. <laughs> she worked on the, on the panographs, and I did the trimming. That was uh, it. And until they closed the department down, she yeah. was there, and then... When I retired, and they quit. <laughs> I said, see? You couldn't do it without me. <laughs> I want to be 84 years old. I don't think they want me back there. <laughs> she would. I probably would after I retire. Mm -hmm. I work at Piggly Wiggly in produce and in floral. Still working. <laughs> <laughs> it was fun. We had fun. Hamilton's was the best job I had. It's living history. And the first people that welcomed me here, they were the volunteers that have worked manufacturing this product. They just didn't understand why I was there, and why I traveled all that distance. Why wood type? When they saw the work, of course, they got even more puzzled. They said, I see colors and I see the letter B. I don't read a word. And I said, right, there's no word there. But what you see, the colors and the letters, that's it. That made it even more confusing to them. But slowly, I think, when I came back again and again and they saw more work, they started to make comments. So I asked them, you think this color is too bright? They said, no, it's OK. The letter is too big. And I thought, I got them. Don't ask me what, what they are, really. This is Dennis's work. He always goes with, the, with the putting on you know, different letters on top of each other with different colors. Here is a, all the different kind of stuff. The ones. I mean, you know, they have quite an imagination. <laughs> When I was working at Hamilton, I never have any time to play around with that stuff. I'm good at what I do because I'm the last one. <laughs> and there's no one that I can really compare myself to, you know. The hardest part is really preparing the wood. Cutting it to line and all of that. 
and running the height machine. And in the summer, oh, that sweat just rolls off you. <laughs> over here all you, you do sit and get fat asses you know by 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 following a pattern all day long <laughs> it's frustrating to me these people are obviously getting older in age and none of this is documented See, this is six line gauge. Like it's just, it's gonna sort of die with them. And I think that that's not, that, that's not right. If it were something else that the world had more focus on, no one would let that happen. I hope you get younger people interested in our museum. If we were in a metropolitan area like Chicago, you'd have so many people. So that's one thing. Two Rivers is so far to come. I'm under lots of pressure from the board and the fire department. Like, you know, clean this area up back here. with one person, things don't happen so quickly. You just have to deal with your situation the best you can. The word Hamilton has now disappeared. Thermo bought Fisher Hamilton. They make fume hoods here for scientific experiments. They're going to start to produce those in Mexico now. You can see it's hard right now. Lots of jobs leaving northeast Wisconsin. And so it's sad for me to see these guys are working themselves out of a job. There's nothing really big no if more. If Hamilton town. closes, I said it'd be a ghost town. Yeah, <laughs> it just would. I mean, you could graduate from high school and you knew you'd get a job that summer. It was no problem. Now, it's just nothing. In 1988, I had a gentleman who came to me in my business and said, uh, "What's there doing to rivers today?" I had no place to send them. It was November. We had one museum that was closed. Absolutely nothing for that gentleman to do. It embarrassed me. So I made up my mind right then and there, if it were possible, I'd like to develop reasons for people to stay. And uh, we're getting ready to open the farm museum, and that's going to be number five. That's a bit unusual, you know. It's unusual to have five museums in this town of 13,000. They bring a lot of people to Two Rivers. This is the museum capital of Wisconsin. It's probably a tourist town, but that's on their way to Door County. It's a stop over. That's about all it really is. Yeah. You can kind of understand why this kind of died out because it's, it's so tedious. I mean, the results are well worth it, but 
once it's done, you figure you just want to be done with it, but then it takes twice as long to put everything away as it did to put it together to start with. What are you going to do? It's going to be easily a couple of years just to get all this stuff organized. When we first got them, we were trying to clear out all the dust out of everything. And you can't just take like an air hose to it because it blows them everywhere. And my fingers are really fat, so it's hard to <laughs> pick stuff up. This ampersand is really nice. Something I might want to use. When I was at Hamilton, the first time I was there, it was great because I got inspired to say, no, I want to, you know, I want to do that because I can do that. And we literally have pictures of us running to it, don't we? Yeah. From the parking lot, running into the Type Museum because we were all excited. But we got lucky. We um, got a good starter press at Chandler and Price. It's kind of such an enormous task. Man, we have to get all of these parts. Can we possibly even do that? I need to figure out how to fix our rollers. You want these things to be like as smooth as possible so that way when you're inking the form, your ink is consistent and smooth. And these things are really bad. Ours are pretty, pretty out of whack currently. It's like a software crash you gotta figure out what, what to do. If you want, I can just put the, put the rollers on my card. I think we have, I think we have money in the account. We do have money in our account? Yeah. Well, I haven't put my money in, so I know I owe. Rent check. We just have a big box of random wood type. Most of it's metal, we don't have a lot of wood. I think wood breaks so quickly. Now people are just grabbing it up and putting it on their coffee tables, unfortunately. You go to those craft shows and those hobby moms are gluing it to like home sweet home, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Michael's craft store. Yeah, killing stuff. the type. It's kind of humorous. There's this like pop culture around it. Like I'm gonna get my wedding invites letter pressed. Then. In a lot of boutique stores, you see a lot of letterpress cards. One of the things that we have not done is actually make a plate. We haven't like taken something digital that we've done on our computers first and then printed something on our letterpress. No one's made a polymer plate. Everything has been setting type. It is laborious, but there's this piece that you find within it while you're doing it that you can't find if you just slap on a plate and then it's done. A lot of people think polymer has ruined letterpress. It's not ruined, it is just tainted it. Because you're using the computer, which goes against everything that letterpress was in its history. I exposed photosensitive plastic called polymer to ultraviolet light. The plastic is water soluble and it washes away leaving the relief. I can use my Mac as my design tool and still print them with my Vandercook. For the most part, sterical press prints wedding invitations. That's kind of the demand for um, letterpress printed things in the world today. You can replicate the feel of a wood type poster. Things that have a deep impression where the letters are really pressed into the paper. I mean, I've had clients that if it doesn't look letter pressed, they don't want it. With wood type, if you've smashed a serif or you've lost the dot over an eye, that little extra love and wear and tear is what makes wood type so wonderful. And certainly I can create filters and whatnot on the computer to try and duplicate that, but it's not the real thing. Yeah, that ain't gonna happen. <laughs> 
I am surprised you thought that that would work. Polymer is totally inauthentic, but it's so completely practical. It's scalable type in the digital world. 72-point bedoni is the same as 12-point bedoni, whereas in the lead type world, they were two different drawings, two different needs, two different drawers of type. One was a display type and one was a text type, and polymer gives you freedom to shrink things by a sixteenth of an inch, where a lot of projects wouldn't get done if you were limited by what type is sitting in drawers. Well, and who has time to really set paragraphs like that? It's just, it's not possible because who is willing to pay you to be that authentic? Nobody, really. Hamilton commissioned me to design a typeface to pay homage to such an amazing industry. The process is just fascinating because you go from analog to digital and back to analog again, and that crossing of that threshold between one technology and the other is really an exciting thing. First we made the six inch tall templates, and there was something really intriguing about Norb's handiwork. When I designed this, this should have been a, a straight angular interior, but the router bit left this very characteristic mark on it, and so as Norb is working, it's like, oh, stop, 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 no, no that's perfect. Oh, but I gotta finish the serifs, I gotta make all those little points you want. No, 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 it's okay. Well, that's not, you know, he, he gently protests, it's like, that's, that's not how this is done. Yeah, and then Bill, he says that he, he likes, likes it, it better round. Yeah, yeah, he likes it when it's not finished, not trimmed. <laughs> so, well, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. You know, I think I think it, it, this looks better the way it's supposed to be here. You know, it's like no, no, no. This is good. What a great way to let the aesthetics be um, 